Happy Labor Day. Welcome back to now mid-football season. We're officially a week in. We are a weekend, and what an opening weekend. I mean, we learned a bunch of stuff. We had some of the most amazing, entertaining games in this opening weekend, and I think this is the greatest week one that I've ever seen. Mm. Uh, really? Why, why do you say that? What makes you say that? Well, look at the ACC, for example. North Carolina and North Carolina State were, were in desperate victories that they could have lost on one play multiple times. You've got Ohio State whose defense showed what they needed to show. Ohio State's defense for the last several years has squandered some of the best offenses in their history. And it's not because of talent or effort. It's because they have gotten sloppy in the basic fundamentals of stand in the right place, look at the right guy, and attack. And last year, they kept on opening doors by being in the wrong spot, and guys didn't have to be blocked out of the way. Against Notre Dame, they tightened that up, especially in the second half. And there was nowhere for Notre Dame to run at that point. And that's what Ohio State needs in order to be able to complement their great offense and challenge for a national championship. So these are all things that we have good indications of in week one. Yeah, touche. So many great games, great finishes. Utah and Florida was epic. LSU and Florida <laughs> State was that one up unbelievable. I mean, just <laughs> so many great finishes to games in the opening weekend of college football. Trevor, I do want to focus on BYU, obviously, here after putting up 50 points in their season opener. I think we can put to bed the curse of Florida – and going two time zones to open the season and the year. Yeah, play like crappy teams in Florida. BYU showed up. <laughs> they looked great. In your opinion, where did they exceed expectations? I thought in big plays, especially in the running game. And that's good and that's bad. You know, they, they ran for over 300 yards against an improved USF defense. They brought in some... Uh, transfers, especially on the defensive line, that should have really elevated that defense. And BYU just just went through them uh, like like a hot knife through pate. That's a nod to Oregon and Georgia. Sorry about that. <laughs> the, uh, but I, I think that that was an important thing. Uh, one thing, though, you've got to watch out for is that about half of those 300 yards came on three plays, 75 of them by a wide receiver, not a running back. So BYU fans, I think, need to understand that that everything's a work in progress. And as well as they did against USF, that running game was dominant. A lot of young receivers got to step up because of injuries to the top two guys. They did well. I think that's a good start. And now against Baylor, everything gets a whole lot more difficult. Absolutely. Uh, you mentioned Puka Nakua, just incredible. Before he injures his ankle, hopefully he's all right and, and good against Florida. Christopher Brooks expected to be uh, the replacement for Tyler Algier. I don't know what the consensus is on him, but it feels like we think he can be like at least 75% of what Tyler was last year, right? And Chris is a very good player of his own right. 13 for 135 and a touch, notably two rushes of 40-plus in this game. What did you think of his performance with that offensive line? He looked powerful, didn't he? I mean, he looks solid when defenders were trying to tackle him. It was like he would just shrug him off. And, and that's a good thing because that's what Tyler Algier brought. He brought that, that physicality and that ability to just bound people and wear them down. And Christopher Brooks showed that kind of capability. You know, the, the I don't know how, how long he can keep that up. Let's hope he can. I'd like to see him catch a few more balls because that's one thing that Tyler brought to it. You never knew if he was going to have his touch by a handoff or a pitch or a throw down the field. And so I'd like to see a little bit more of that from Chris Brooks. But at the same time, I think the the – First game as a BYU Cougar was incredibly encouraging. Trevor Maddish, ESPN with us on BYU Sports Nation. Trevor, where is your biggest concern for BYU lying in uh, the Baylor game ahead and, and after what you saw from them in Florida as they push forward to their home opener? Well, special teams, coverage units, for goodness sake. Uh, for goodness sake, they gave up a kickoff return for a touchdown. Then a little bit later, they gave up a long kickoff return and tacked on a personal foul penalty that gave USF a short field to score a touchdown. That, that's two of their three touchdowns uh, right there. And so that was a big deal. And so the coverage units are going to have to step up. That's huge. Another thing I think is that 
that the young receivers, as well as they did against USF, are going to be covered a lot more tightly against Baylor. Although I will say this, that if there's any question that Baylor has coming into the season, it probably is with a secondary because they lost so much talent in the back end off of last year's team. And so the the health situation of Pukunakua and Gunnar Romney is going to be critical. And the young guys that have to step up and play, regardless of whether those two guys play, are going to have to play at a high level because they have an opportunity to create an advantage against Baylor. And whether or not they can do that might be the key to this whole game. It feels like 1983-84 here with Baylor, where in 83 they won, in 84 BYU won, home fields there. That's the hope for BYU fans, certainly, in the home opener and a confident team that returns a lot of pieces back. How do you see these two teams matching up Saturday in a top 25 showdown? It's going to be much more of a fair fight than I think it was last year. Last year, by the time that game occurred, BYU's defensive front seven, especially, we just ran out of people. And there were a lot of guys playing as starters and in significant roles on the BYU front seven last year against Baylor that weren't expected to have such big roles. And then the depth was also weakened because the guys that were the depth had to step up and play in significant roles. But that helps this year because you've got more guys now with experience that they ordinarily wouldn't have had. And that's going to be critical because BYU, according to Pro Football Focus, came into this season with the number six offensive line in all of college football. But they also ranked Baylor as the number four offensive line in all of college football. And even though Baylor lost their top two rushers, they still have a good stable of running backs to run behind that line. So to me, the the most critical matchup, other than BYU's receivers against the secondary of Baylor's defense, excuse me, BYU's a wide receiver against the secondary, the critical matchup is going to be the front seven of BYU. Being healthy now, relative to what they were last year, will they be able to stop this or at least slow down this Baylor rushing attack? Because if they can do that, a lot of other good things will happen. It's a Maddox Monday with ESPN's Trevor Maddich on BYU Sports Nation. Trevor, is there anything you learned about BYU that you felt like you weren't sure on after one week? Uh, no, no. They, they performed kind of as expected. I mean, I, I thought that, that what happened would happen you know, I thought that the running game and Chris Brooks, especially, and Katoa did a really good job. And I think that's important. I mean, those, those things are are things that we expected coming into the season. So this game against South Florida, which was more tricky than people really realized um, going into it, I think they performed at a high enough level in all the ways that they needed to perform, except for that kickoff coverage, that you can say that BYU didn't surprise in any negative way. And I don't think that they could have surprised in a positive way in this game it only could have been a negative surprise, and they didn't do that. They, they, for the most part, were steady and solid as expected. Jaron Hall goes 25 of 32, 261, two touchdowns. Did throw an interception in the red zone, in the end zone. But uh, that was also South Florida could just snap it over the puncher's head and BYU got the ball back. That was a heady move by Jaron just to reset there for two extra points. But what did you think of his performance in game one? I thought he was steady. He was solid. It wasn't particularly awesome, but it didn't need to be. What he needed to do was manage the tools around him, and he did. I think in this game, he'll need to be against Baylor. He'll need to be a bigger playmaker. But overall, he's getting he's getting a lot of buzz as one of those quarterbacks in that next tier that people aren't talking enough about. And this game against Baylor is going to give him an opportunity uh, to showcase that. Now, against USF, was he spectacular? Nope. But did he do what a BYU quarterback needs to do in this kind of a situation? The answer to that is yes. And I think people talk about being a game manager is a negative thing. And that's not negative. It's a good thing. If you can manage the game, that means that you're getting the most out of the players around you and the situations around you. And I thought that he did that in this game for the most part. Yeah, and uh, we should note that he's a drop pass by Keanu Hill away from going over 300 yards down the sideline, right? And his rating was 161. Um, Trevor, I did want to follow up on that. Do you feel like he managed the game despite 25 completions and the pass rating of 160-plus? Uh, I feel like it was more than that. 
Yeah, it seemed like there there would have been more than that. His QBR was 84, which is good. QBR quarterback rating is not just his rating as a passer, but it brings into it running and situations. So when you do what you do, and if the situation is critical, if it's a third down and it's third and 20 and you throw it for 10 yards, your passer rating goes up, but your QBR goes down, that kind of a thing. This QBR uh, was 84 out of 50 is average. 100 is maximum. So according to that, he was incredibly steady and didn't just play winning football, but he played outstanding football, according to the steadiness as indicated by the QBR rating. A few big picture questions for you now, Trevor. Uh, lost in kind of the shadow of the actual games over the weekend. Was this little bit of news that the college football playoff is expanding to 12 teams? Hello. What? <laughs> like All of a sudden it was off the table, then it was back on, now it's apparently happening starting in 2026. What do you think of the decision to expand to a 12-team playoff? This is wonderful. I mean, wonderful. The And there's two reasons. One is that it, it restores the importance of conference championship races. In this 14 playoff, conference championships are a tiebreaker to be applied at the end of the process if they have to split hairs because they couldn't differentiate teams by other means. To me, that diminishes the value of conference championships. Now what you've got is the top six conference champions have an automatic berth. There's five power five conferences. That means a group of five conference champion is going to make it, and maybe more than one, depending on the ranking of a power five conference champion. So those championship races are restored for their importance. You could lose a couple of games early because maybe you've got some injuries or a new quarterback or a new coach or something, and then you can come back and win your conference and still have a chance to make that playoff. That's important. Plus, the top four ranked conference champions, are they get a bye. And so not the top four ranked teams, the four ranked conference champions get a buy. And to me, that, that also restores the value of conference championship races. The other thing is that it tells us that it doesn't look like we're going to have uh, another top tier forming in college football anytime mm -hmm. soon. The, my big worry was that the SEC and the Big Ten, with all this conference expansion, would add a few more teams and then make their own division, have their own playoff to the exclusion of everybody else. But the fact that they now have all agreed on this 12-team playoff with gives access to everybody tells me that they are likely to, well, they're, they're unlikely, if not absolutely not going to, make that upper tier division for the foreseeable future. So for the stability of the future of college football with all the conference realignment and all those things, this, I think, adds a level of concrete stability that says that everything's going to slow down now and nothing massive is going to change beyond some scheduling and the conference logo sewn onto the jerseys of a few teams. And BYU will have that Big 12 logo proudly on its jersey next year. Now they know in a couple of years when this expands to 12, K proudly... You have to have zero or one losses, probably, to uh, sneak into that. Perhaps two, but probably not. Okay, let's finish with this. Uh, some notable names on BYU schedules had some big wins, but several had notable losses, namely Oregon and Notre Dame and Boise State. I guess which one of these opponents uh, surprised you in a loss the most? I think Boise State. Oregon State is an underrated team. People don't understand how physical Oregon State has become. They're a tough out now. And so it's no, it's no, you know, it, it, it's not embarrassing to lose to Oregon State, but they lost by a lot. They got dominated by Oregon State, and that surprises me for a Boise State program that normally doesn't get dominated that way. And so that surprised me. Oregon getting obliterated surprised me a lot because Oregon came into the season with one of the best combinations of offensive line and defensive front seven, D-line and linebackers, in all of college football. And I thought that would be enough for them to have a fair fight in the trenches and keep this thing relatively close. And they didn't do that. On both sides of the line of scrimmage, Georgia just dominated them. And so that tells us two things. It tells us that, that Georgia is probably back and probably underrated. But it also says that maybe Oregon is as good as we thought in those trenches, and they're not able to overcome that with skill position play, at least not yet. So, you know, for BYU fans, you know, you can't take too much away from week one, and Georgia is the defending national champions. But that game against Oregon now looks a lot more winnable than it did before yesterday or before Saturday's games. Trevor, we'll finish with this. Who was the most impressive team that you saw after week one? The most impressive team was Georgia. For that very reason, I mean, the defense lost five first-round draft choices off of last year's team. And 
they won't be better on defense, maybe not even quite as good, but they still will be one of the best defenses in the country. Jalen Carter on the defensive line might end up being the best defensive player in all of college football and be that next top 10 draft pick off of that defensive line. So that defense looks like it's reloaded. The offense, though, with Stetson Bennett at quarterback has shown that it is a playmaking offense, not just a complementary offense to their great defense. Stetson Bennett gets a, a bad rap because he doesn't look like a big, powerful quarterback in his uniform, you know? So people think he's just a game manager along for the ride. But when you watch his games, he makes plays. I mean, there are times when he'll drop a cape and have everything break down and run around. He'll break tackles. He'll avoid tackles. And then he'll make a, a touchdown throw in, th in ways that you would think only Bryce Young could do. Now, I'm not saying he's Bryce Young, but I'm saying that he has picked up from where he left off last year from a standpoint of not just managing the game, but from a standpoint of making plays when he, ha he has to be the playmaker. And I think Georgia against that Oregon team, which I do think is very good, I, I think that overall Georgia is underrated right now if you rank them at number three. Trevor, you have also reloaded with knowledge and are number one in our power rankings of analysts after week number, number one. one. Congratulations. Thanks, guys. <laughs> ESPN's Trevor Maddich with us on BYU Sports Nation. That's